And I'll give you a brief overview of other OpenCL projects that are current or ongoing. That's the Lattice Boltzmann method, the snow simulation uh, we've written, the SPH, which is smoothed particle hydrodynamics, BLOS, which is basic linear algebra subprograms, and a rigid body simulation that I hope to show a video of if I have time. If not, I'll just show you to the YouTube page. Um, finally, I want to talk about reducing bandwidth through compression. The reason I want to mention that topic is it shows you um, how you actually can reduce your time, compute time or overall time by doing extra computations. Uh, in this case, you're doing it by compressing and decompressing data. Because the, moving the data is so expensive, they're just getting it off the disk or off the RAM, that it will actually pay, and we have proven that, you can actually pay to offload the calculations of a decompressing and compressing to the GPU part while you're calculating on the CPU. Pretty cool, huh? Of course, that requires that you have an algorithm that is not only doing good compression, but that is fast in itself, right? So there's two criteria. Usually you talk about compression, you worry about the quality of the compression. You also have to worry about the speed of the algorithm. Finally, I may or may not show some videos, depending on my time, and talk to my, uh, my thoughts of going, where we're going from here. So our current work focuses on research related to novel GPU and multi-core architectures. I mentioned I've produced a bunch of students, and in particular area, which is not surprising for Norway, we're looking at a lot of seismic related uh, and image uh, related uh, applications. You know, medical uh, is always well funded by any government. Uh, and then of course, Norway being a big oil nation, and we have a lot of uh, companies in town, such as Statoil, and smaller companies like Numerical Rocks, they're always interested in uh, doing collaborative projects. In fact, I used to myself work at Schlumberger for three years after my PhD before returning to uh, academia. So I'm actually one of those I can claim to have some, quote, real experience, right? <laughs> um, my first two projects with GPU programming uh, that I supervised uh, came in the fall of 2006. Um, there was one project written then by Christian Larsen, who later went to uh, Rockstar, is now back with Schlumberger, he did that project with Schlumberger, and he wrote a wonderfully detailed, really like a complete master's thesis, although it was just a master's project, sort of fall project, on utilizing GPUs and cluster computing. Of course, this is before CUDA, and so this is actually written in CG, in the, uh, sort of the shader language, if you wish. Um, and then the same uh, fall, I sprang out about $1,000 and bought an FX4800 card, admittedly a NVIDIA card, and we did a project for GE Healthcare. Um, at the same time, I was the head of uh, Computational Science Evaluation Program at NTNU, and on the, that side, we actually went and bought an IBM supercomputer that also runs our um, operational weather forecasting. That it wasn't so oppressive as far as number of flops, we uh, have a 10 times bigger cluster up in Tromsø just shortly after, but it's the federation switch that makes the difference, that you have a very high interconnect. And just as like this talk, we'll be hearing time and time again through this conference, interconnect and connecting speed and moving data, and the energy to move the data is the big issue of the day, right? That's the big pain of heterogeneous computing. And in many ways, these IBM supercomputers have the same kind of issues. Um, here you see some of the master's thesis that were done in 2007, and there are the two first master's thesis uh, on the GPU. The real-time wavelet filtering algorithm on the GPU was a giant project with GE Healthcare. We got a 40 times speed up of the wavelet algorithm that, we, that he wrote in CG, uh, and basically took that cardio ultrasound sc scanner, it was the high-end scanner, but nevertheless, from computing things offline to almost real time by 40, to get a 40 times speed up. Today, this audience not impressed with 4 times speed up, piece of cake, but uh, in 2006, 2007, that was big news. That was so big news that the, math, the student finished the thesis in May, and by the fall, GE had put it in the, actually implemented the algorithm in their high end product. And that's what I can claim, you know, impact and success, and put us on the map of how to do GPU computing. And although a lot of other students did um, interesting other MPI-related work, and some of you know I actually served on the original MPI committee, and so not surprising that we're still doing MPI codes. Um, 
uh, and also the hybrid codes with OpenMP. Uh, we have several more projects coming up on GPU computing. In 2008, uh, like I said, the 70 teraflop supercomputer was installed in Tromsø. We also had access to that. It was sort of your standard big compute cluster, if you wish. And we started getting uh, several donations from NVIDIA through their uh, professor affiliates program. We also uh, got some quad-core machines donated by Schlumberger, uh, and uh, several more master's thesis or, uh, projects were written that fall. And we looked at latency bandwidth impact on GPU systems. That was actually turned into a paper at Parco in 2009. And we also did our first sort of non-numerical code, which is linear optimization with CUDA, one of the first um, uh, GPU programs that were actually showed successfully at could do linear programming on the GPU. They'd actually been tried by master's thesis in Germany uh, a little time before that, but they kind of struggled. And we show that at least there is hope. In 2009, we started getting a lot more uh, equipment. We got an S1070, that's a four GPU system from NVIDIA. We also got our first AMD, and so far, hopefully they will be one of many AMD um, computers or uh, cards, which is the 5870 cards. And we have two of those, one donated and one we bought. Um, notice at this point, you'll see the clocks are starting to um, differentiate uh, the speed from the memory to the processor. So there's actually two clocks on the NVIDIA system. And you can see how they're diff different. And you'll, I think you'll see more and more of this in uh, future technology. It's not just one system clock anymore necessarily. There may be actually different speeds between a memory clock in the processor clock. And who knows what AMD will do in this area? I don't know, but I'm already seeing a trend in that. That makes things even more hairy as far as timing and benchmarking and all those figures you see thrown up there. I just want to make you a note of that because you know flops are not what they used to be is what the bottom line is. Um, in 2009, we started seeing even more uh, GPU projects. We did a real-time visualization of snow and I'll talk a little bit more about that one later. We also showed the deep, uh, using GPU techniques for porous rock simulation. As you know, porous rocks may have water and oil in them, so highly interesting for the oil industry. Um, and we took a sort of um, a futuristic project looking at the NVIDIA ION, which not integrating on a chip like the AMD Fusion, but integrating on the board, um, the CPU and the GPU. So the GPU had actually access to real memory. Now the ION is a very low end system. So, of course, it didn't work all that great. We, it was too, a little bit too on, uh, low end for the project. But we just sort of used it as a test case because we felt that this was going to uh, be the way to go. And like I said, this is two years ago, and things are changing already. Uh, but it was a fun test uh, case to look at. We also did several more GPU projects that sp uh, spring, uh, as you can see, or that summer, um, including the seismic data compression uh, First attempt to stab at that wasn't quite as successful. We did a much better job later. Um, and also you see now again another medical project where we're doing parallel techniques for estimation or correction aberration in medical sound imaging. Um, then we also did one with Statoil on seismic shot processing on the GPU and modeling communication on multi-GPU systems, which I'll get back to later, which also was published as a paper. As to what was the one uh, of Eric Oxness on the LBM method. 2010, we continued to do a lot uh, of uh, GPU projects. We were looking at the effects of compression, that was last year. We also checked audio processing. And uh, we're now also trying to integrate more physics into our snow simulation. That's still an ongoing project. Um, also, the project on real time GPU based 3D ultrasound reconstruction visualization was started last uh, spring as a master's thesis and continues today as, um, as part of a, a MS and PhD projects. My uh, PhD student finished last fall, but he did automatic runtime communication and I.O., where he actually injected code into the MPI library to um, automatically insert asynchronous communication where people have written synchronous communication. This is to hide latency. Now, this, as you may know, latency in memory, again, is main topics, both in this world and in the MPI world. And when you try to use GPUs across multiple platforms, you likely for the time being, we're using MPI anyway. So it's still re relevant for this conference, although I will not talk too much about that project, but mentioning it. 
This is my um, last year's group of uh, students that you saw in the previous slide. But we also have you know, lots of projects that I'm not mentioning for all the people that visit my lab. And these are just the local ones uh, cyber, from cybernetics, visualization, and from the uh, architecture group, from marine sciences. Uh, and it's, you see these two from the applied math department. And also then have visitors uh, from Spain, from Poland. I'm getting someone from Belgium. And today I heard a confirmation someone from Canada all like to come to my lab and uh, hang out and hopefully get to do great work together on GPU computing. My current uh, group of students, uh, I just got uh, Ian Carlin from University of Colorado, who's an expert on heterogeneous computing, has worked at both, had summer jobs at both Los Alamos and Sandia. Very pleased that he picked a postdoc at Norway over Sandia because the Mark Curie's group was trying to get him, so I consider that a, quite a steal. Um, and he will be a great asset to our group. Uh, Jan Kristian is about finishing, and he's done a lot of parallel modding on uh, heterogeneous platforms. Uh, Rune is just starting, as is Eric. And Eric and Tor Kristian, as my master's students, work on this medical imaging that I'm talking more about. And all of the other students uh, are also, use, uh, master's students, are working on OpenCL um, codes of GPU computing. The biggest GPU limitation, as you've heard of previous today, said by several, is that it really is a SIMD processor, right? It really is liking a stream processor. It likes a lot of data doing the same thing at the same time. And so when you have that, branching is usually not a good idea, right? Because it just messes up everything. And this makes also random uh, memory access problematic. You'll still have this problem for a time to come because the GPU, are, although, as the ARM speaker said, there aren't a limited number of parallel programming uh, algorithms out there that will work on the SIMD machine, you'll still try to use them as much as you can because it gives us great performance per watt, right? And so if you at all reformulate your problem that will make, make it work in that section, then it's, you're good to go. The problem is it's not easy, right? The other trick is that GPU caches are different from the CPU caches and often optimized for 2D locality because of the graphics. And there's still an issue with the floating point precision. So cards today would typically have a 1 to 8 ratio between double and single precision. And when you iterate and scale your problems up to millions, you know, that's going to actually affect your round off error numerically. So you actually have to, you're starting to see mixed precision um, algorithms and the libraries. Hopefully not something all developers have to deal with, but it is an issue nevertheless. Um, we do a lot of teaching on GPU computing. My senior uh, parallel computing class last fall had 43 students taking the final, which makes it one of the largest parallel computing classes at that level anywhere as far as I know. I know University of Maryland and uh, Illinois had a cooperation with about 20 students each over some video conferencing. Um, I also hold a master's level seminar each fall that specializes and we try to look at current papers and PhD course on heterogeneous cloud computing. We're also told to be a NVIDIA computing, uh, now a NVIDIA computing teaching center, so they gave us 20 graphics card, hence the majority of the cards there. But you only see one of the 5870, because the other one is actually used in benchmarking, so we couldn't take it out for the picture, but we actually do have two of those. We hope to have much more. And like I say, the, uh, the locality issue and the power issue is central. And now we're going to look a little bit more about uh, actually the medical image reconstruction and the surface extraction. Now, for the ultrasound uh, reconstruction, I worked with Dr. Frank Lindsted, who's at the Sintef, which is a research lab in Norway, uh, medical technology that are actually co-located with the University Hospital in Trondheim. And my master's students, Holger and Tue, uh, Christian. Now, uh, Holge did the initial implementation in CUDA, and then Tuud Kristian did an OpenCL uh, version this fall. So the idea is that you have little handheld ultrasound uh, scanning devices, and you, they take you know, scans as you move along, and you want to put them together in a 3D image so you can get an idea of what's going on. Uh, a little bit scary in that, that one of the applications is actually brain surgery, where they're actually looking for the tumor, because it's, your sort of innards in your head tends to shift during surgery, and they want to sort of know where the actual tumor is, and I'll cut up too much pieces of your brain. And uh, I remember last fall when 
uh, uh, sorry, last spring when the Holger was doing it, they were asking for testing it in a lab, and, or testing it in a theater, as they called it. And I got a little nervous and said, uh, well, let's try to debug this code a little more before we ship it up, because I don't want to be headlining uh, about brain surgery. So, and sure enough, Twitkistan found several bugs. So, you know, that's a little scary when you actually write these real codes that people want. Uh, for us computer scientists, I like to use these, I call them zero and one problems, right? I mean, everything goes from, you know, location zero to, to location one, and your nice square domains and everything, you know, it's nice smooth data. Uh, and with all we think all our algorithms work because they worked on these wonderful test data, but once you start using real life uh, test data, it gets a lot more hairy to debug because people can be moving this thing at different speeds. They can be moving it a little bit, you know, not in a totally straight line. And there are lots of issues that happen during scanning that you may not take into account properly and will give you sort of slightly erroneous results. So they look good, so you can certainly publish papers and, and talk about it at conferences, but whether you really want the doctors to operate within the dose conditions, uh, I don't know. But I don't know about you guys. Maybe you guys have a lot more confidence in your programming skills, but it does make me nervous. And it does actually beg the question we should think about as we paralyze and make these so complex, how do we debug properly, right? How do we not only just get pretty pictures, but verify our results in other ways. I mean, I think we need to do a lot more thinking in that area. Now, our challenges here was to calculate 64 million voxels from a circa 400 B scan. And then, oh, that was loud. Uh, and this was used during surgery, so sort of near real time reconstruction is very important. I mean, they can wait a second or two, but they don't want to wait half a minute, right? Because, you know, you don't want to be poking in this guy's brain for half a minute while you're waiting for the 3D reconstruction to happen. And that was sort of pretty much the time it before. And of course, you want to keep the cost down. You want, don't want to buy a super fancy, uh, big supercomputer to have to attach to it. You want to be able to, you know, with, if you have a handheld device, you really don't want to have to drag a supercomputer around to you know, do the processing, right? That doesn't sort of make sense. It's sort of counterintuitive. So um, the solution, of course, was to do 3D acceleration. We used the VVN uh, N algorithm. Uh, we had to do a bunch of operations for each voxel. And the chief of construction, and we have papers on it line for the details, uh, so I won't have time to overview that today. But basically, you can see we got sort of a almost 30 times speed up by using the GPU versus just the CPU. And that's a very nice speed up. Um, that was done on the Intel 2 core, as you can see, with an uh, NVIDIA FX 5800, uh, 5800, which is a quadro card. Uh, the nice thing about using the quadro card is that it gives you stereo for free. So if you have one lying around, you might as well use it. Uh, otherwise, you have to use, uh, yeah, it's still possible to program stereo, but it just, sort of gives it to you for free, and that was the main reason for using the Quadro. It didn't have to be a Quadro card. It was just, just nice to use for this, um, this project, with this, uh, doing them. And here you see some more imaging. You, try to, you see several slices that are trying to be put together, and I'm sorry about the quality. It's not coming out very well, but this is sort of a 3D volume, and you're supposed to look, look for these artifacts. Uh, and I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not going to claim, but we just got some images we're allowed to share. Because, you know, some of these things have privacy issues. A lot of people don't want their brain scan, uh, you know, lying, floating around on the internet. So there's always issues with that when you deal with medical too. Um, then we're going to talk about the surface extraction. Um, and it's another known problem, uh, but we also wanted to show how you could do this in OpenCL. It's not like it hasn't been done before. Several CUDA implementations are out there. So here you're trying to sort of, you can see you extracted the surface of the skull. Uh, we used a fairly standard method for this, the Martin cube algorithm. And that extracts the 3D surfaces from a set of sampled scalars. And algorithm uses ext uh, extensively from, uh, throughout visualization and analyzing medical data, for instance, x-rays and MRIs. And the results, of course, are these 3D segmentations. Uh, and it's nice about it is that it's completely data parallel. And the challenge is how do you store results of each cube in parallel on the GPU? This is fairly stand straightforward in the serial, and that's just a mar marching cube uh, algorithm right there. And in serial, you basically use a stack, and you sort of toss each version data on a stack, and then you can pop them. Uh, and then for this GPU solution, this is fairly well known now, it's a histogram pyramid. 
And you saw that in Ziegel and all, in 2006 published uh, how you can do on the flight point clouds to histogram pyramids. Uh, this is a data structure that we filter out the cube that has no triangle, which is a stream reduction, and return a total sum of triangles. And then for each cube, it provides it with an index for the memory storage. Um, the nice thing is that you now can use the texture, you know, textures. And as you know, the texture operations are really fast, uh, the fastest operations you can do on your graphics cards, hence you could get a really great speed up. Uh, this is just a sort of image of how you do the histogram pyramid construction and traversal. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that here. You can see it in our paper. And that's why I just sort of cut them out of paper so you could not spend too much time focusing too hard on them. But you basically um, try to create these things that let, allow you to stream really well. Now, the interesting thing is about the uh, HPMC Daikin et al. versus our OpenCL implementation. You'll note that the OpenCL, OpenGL uh, synchronization causes some problems in the lower field. Because look here at that data. These are the same sizes. And the black one is from the HPMC Daikin et al. You see several implementations of their algorithm up there. Um, but you notice in the first part, we're actually slower, right? We're taking more time. And this is because uh, we think, we seem to, from our data, is that OpenCL, OpenGL synchronization was me measured to be 20 to, uh, up to 20 mi uh, milliseconds, which is actually 70 to 90% of the overall uh, execution time for the smallest data sets. But of course, as we get the big set data sets, uh, because we have such a good uh, reduction in the memory size, and the way we implemented it, you can see we did it much, much better. Because once you start freaking out, over the memory, you know, how much memory you're using, of course, that's the whole core. It's like data locality again, right? Just goes on and on. Our test system was an Intel i5. It was a Radeon 5870 card. Uh, and we used the OpenCL 1.1 for this particular um, data run. And we got really nice images. So I mean, so I had a sort of a cruddy one so it wouldn't take too long to load. But this is our actual results. And you can see how they look nice and clear. Um, and you can really see the feature extractions from the skull and also I think it's a blood vessel system that you saw in uh, Daikin's paper originally. So we just found the skull on the web and then the other one was from the Daikin set. Any questions about this so far? I now talk briefly about some of our um, other open CL pro projects. I've like I say, I could talk uh, a lot about the details of this, op this medical imaging ones, but I try to uh, rather to also say that OpenCL can also be used for much many more things. I'll talk a little bit about our LBM, which I mentioned earlier, the snow simulator, the smooth particle uh, hydrodynamics. I'll not say much about the BLAS, that's a basic linear algebra programming, other than that we are working on getting some of the BLAS optimized for OpenCL. Uh, hopefully better than it's been done so far. It's an ongoing project. Stay tuned for later this summer and again this fall. Uh, we'll pay uh, close attention to what's the available as far as programming environment. And also mention some reducing bandwidth through compression. I may not, uh, we'll ha have to watch some videos at break time, I think. So, um, the project started with uh, Oxness, my grad student Oxness, so I hope to also have a PhD student. We published a paper in Parco 2009 and it, uh, on how to use the lattice Boltzmann method for creating, um, simulating fluid flows to porous rocks. And that implementation was done in CUDA. It's currently in, be done in OpenCL by Tui Christian Waldehagen. It's also got some nice uh, results on how doing OpenCL across multiple GPUs. Um, so, and in fact, we're testing both two uh, Fermi cards on one PC and also the S1070. We have the four GPUs, right? That's the 10 series. So, testing several um, configurations, and that will be um, shown last. Um, as I say, the, they've come out as a master's thesis uh, later this summer. And all of our master's thesis are published online. So, you can go to our webpage, uh, and you can see the webpage right here, and you know, every single slide. And you can look at these master's thesis and you see a lot more details about this project. Now, to support the last uh, lattices and to get high performance, we need to do swap instead of copy approach. And that's sort of the standard approach uh, if you really want to go for high performance on GPUs. 
is a sort of a keyword, a buzzword you can search for how to do it. The configuration of grids and thread blocks or kernels, you have to be sort of be careful how you access the data, again, because of data locality. The register and shared memory movies of the kernels have to be, because as you know, register is your fastest memory, right? And the shared memory is also the share between the threads are also very scarce. You have, don't have enough of it for all those hundreds of threads. So you try to use it as sparingly as possible on those variables that matters the most. And one of the things you do to do that is to do structures of arrays and coalescing. And those are all the two buzzwords you hear a lot in the uh, GPU committing what you have to coalesce your memory. You get that memory so you can stream it. Now to get some matching results from CPU and GPU is building precision, you are going to run into some runoff errors. And so you're going to have to look at how, if you, how your numerical algorithm is performing and doing what needs to be done in double precision in double precision. Now hopefully this in the future will be taking care of libraries and all the developers won't have to worry about it. But as an early uh, adopter, we have to actually worry about these things to get performance. And I'll talk a little bit about our snow simulation. It's sort of our show and tell story. Um, we're actually calculating up to 2 million particles in real time using multi-core CPU and GPU um, course computing together. And get a pretty realistic model of snow particles with calculating also the wind field of that accurately for each and every snowflake, if you wish, in the simulation. It started as a smoke uh, simulation back in 2003, where we tried to run it on a dual core laptop. It was, of course, done typically in a graphics fashion, where we had to do every trick in the book to just make it look real. But you know, the real smoke wasn't, the real physics wasn't there, right? You'd make a lot of shortcuts. And I also uh, warn those people who are in high-performance computing, a lot of the graphic stuff you see out there in games, um, they're getting better and more realistic physics, but a lot of it is also still cheating on, as far as the physics. It looks like it's going blazingly fast, but how real it is as far as calculating what's going on varies strongly. We then did a crude snow simulation back in 2007, and then uh, extended it to the current version uh, that we still are improving. Uh, in, to, in 2008 and 9. We also use it as a framework to test that LBM method because one of the things that happen once you implement something like the LBM is how do you test it that it works? And when you have a 2 million particles, you can't just sit there and stare at 2 million floating point numbers and see if it's accurate, right? You need some way. It's a nice way if you have an, uh, a, a, already a setup that you can sort of throw it into and see if it looks right. You know, at least in Norway, we have a good idea what snow looks like. I think Seattle also has somewhat of an idea. Maybe it doesn't work too well down in Texas, but even there, you know, we could just replace it with heavy water particles or something and to have some torrential rain, and that'll probably do, do it also. And in fact, I thought about having that as a full project, you know, turn the snow particles into some sort of heavy, heavy raindrops and, and see what a good torrent, torrent rain will do to it. Here was our first setup at supercomputing in 08. We're now running it in 3D. And I, I guess I just saw the picture earlier. We have this giant sort of screen we blow up. I call it the bouncing tower because it sort of has the same principle, right, as the bouncing towers you have for kids. And it blows up into the humongous screen and that we then uh, back project on to get the 3D. It's a much cheaper way to do it than any other display wall I've seen. I think it cost me, um, I forget, what's it? forget the exact cost of it, but I assure you it was much, much cheaper than any display wall you know. Just, uh, the projector itself is around $5,000, so much cheaper than those million dollar display walls that you saw in the fancy main hall here. And then you can see that actually, the reason we bought this fancy, we just off the eBay, uh, we just found it on the Amazon, is this um, open case, because that really can t uh, let us point to the graphics card and it looks cool, right? And, and supercomputing, if you want to do a demo, it's important to look cool. That year we had a low budget, so we didn't rent the screen. We just bought the cheapest 40-inch TV at a uh, local store in Austin. That was cheaper than renting it from the conference. So anything that is done low cost, right? Uh, to start simulating avalanches, we looked into smoothed particle hydrodynamics. Um, and uh, the nice thing about it, being able to show how this can be done in real time in GPUs is then you can add any effects as avalanches Geysers, I just came from Iceland yesterday, so that's why I thought of that one. Waterfalls and lakes, uh, or anything that's supposed to be fluid-like, you just have to change the viscosity, right? You get a good, um, and we have some simulations of those running online. 
Um, I know it, uh, so that's, uh, like I said, the loss work is ongoing. I'll try to show the rigid body simulation in a video. I may or may not have time. Well, I think it looks like I will uh, if I talk fast enough, which I'm known for anyway. Uh, but I'll finally want to talk a little bit about reducing bandwidth or compression, the seismic example. And the idea here is that you have an original seismic image, and you want something that shows all features. If you look at this little feature here, it's still there. It's a little bit vaguer, right? So you've done some loss. You have some loss in this, but hopefully, uh, by doing that, for those cases where um, extreme actually doesn't matter, uh, we'll actually prove in that compression a large a seismic image is actually win is a win. Now, the, of course, the hope is that this will actually be implemented in drivers. Now, how somehow your drivers have to detect, I guess, what kind of data you have. Because generally, compressions are highly uh, data dependent, right? You just, you know, seismic data works well uh, for DCT-like compression algorithms. But that doesn't mean that your other type of data works well for that, right? Um, but the point is, you want to try some different, we've tried a bunch of algorithms. And our motivation was, of course, that locality in I.O. is a challenge for data intensive algorithms. So we looked at both um, standard disk drives and also trying to use a faster solid state drive. Oops. And we uh, looked at compressions like JPEG, MPEG, MP3. And we ex explored a lot of GPU comp uh, compression comp capabilities. So we used the GPU to, you know, first, ast assuming you're storing it compressed, First decompress, do your calculation, compress it, and store it back to where it needs to go. And you, hopefully you did that with less time than it took to actually transfer the big data as it was uncompressed. And of course, you needed to do that. I told you, you need to have uh, algorithms that work well and work fast. And the nice thing about this seismic sample is that um, the transfer coding works very well for signal data. And we were highly motivated because what happened was we had a project in the fall we looked at this, had, that dealt with seismic imaging. We threw it on the GPU. We got this 40, 50x speed up. And suddenly, the time, the, you know, the Amdahl's law, the IO, was like now suddenly 80% of the computation after we paralyzed it. That's where it's coming from, right? So you know, this is to sort of solve that um, memory bandwidth problem. Or not solve it, we're trying to improve it. When optimizing for IO, like I say, we need efficient and fast algorithms. Uh, we actually got up to six uh, times speed up, use it on a regular drive with 70 megabytes a second and 3.9 speed up on a SSD drive. This we did through transform recording. Uh, we tried also run light to some of those Huffman's and those non lossy ones. They're not as good. Uh, they do give you some speed up still, which is nice and important, and maybe that's what will be first of all in your drivers. But if you actually select the right compression algorithms for your data, as you can see, we can do much better. And we also tried to uh, do uh, asynchronous I.O. to get the maximum speed up. We also get, uh, give a predictive uh, model in our paper that was pre presented recently at IPDPS in Alaska just two weeks ago or three weeks ago. Uh, and we show that our model is accurate within 5%. And we hope to put this out as a library function by the end of summer so people uh, can go to our website and they can try it out. Uh, I know we'll talk about a little bit about what future. Um, I think it's clear from this conference and everybody here that GPUs offer lots of compute powers at low energy levels. And that's what makes them so attractive. And the fact that they are used by uh, millions in the gaming in industry. Of course, the new, where it's moving, is also into the mobile domain, as you heard both from ARM and also with this AMD Fusion platform. So no longer are only millions of users out there, it's going to be billions. And that's why it's going to be even more important. And this also leads to an exciting future when you integrate the CPU with, oh, that's supposed to be CPU and GPU. Boy, what a typo. Uh, and mobile devices and becoming even more powerful and energy efficient. Uh, sorry about that. It's kind of obvious. Um, and the data locality will only become more important because as you integrate more devices onto one chip, getting things to compute while they're on chip and not have to go off chip for memory is going to be even more and more important. <coughs> so you have this ever, ever challenge about that memory gap. You know, we saw that 
Patterson slide, it's actually worse than that, right? When you go to the GPU heterogeneous domain, it's not such a nice, you know, spread. It just sort of spikes up, right? It really gets, you know, horrible and challenging. Of course, that means that everybody in this room will probably have a job for the next uh, few decades, right? And we're not too unhappy about that. Uh, the future, of course, uh, AMD has, of course, announced a lot of uh, cool processes here. We'll continue, hopefully, uh, to give us more interesting uh, platforms. And so we'll look, pay attention this week. I just grabbed, grabbed some data that was freely available on Wikipedia, and I'm sure the, all the AMD people can show a much cooler slides than this. Uh, another one that was not mentioned, we heard about the AMD, and we heard about uh, ARM, but also Intel, which is tomorrow. The Knights Ferry has now 32 cores. They're testing it, D and others, an interesting technology to be aware of. Another one, as far as dealing with some of the bandwidth issues, is uh, recently this month you saw the page change memory uh, coming out of uh, a project at uh, UCSD, where they're looking at uh, using page change memory uh, both at PCM-based SSD, so it's like an even faster SSD technology, if you wish. And as, as I said, as you try to compress, you have to sort of keep up with that, right? But the, the point is that processors are going to be even faster, so even though this is a faster SSD in some sense, you'll still have to deal with, uh, continue to deal with memory issues. But they show some pretty nice performance comparisons for their test system. Um, OpenCL has been mentioned time and again, including the title of this talk. There's also an effort from the MPI forum on hybrid programming that's worthy of a note for the developers out there. And another current uh, related EU activity over in Europe that I'm involved with, I'm one of four working group uh, leaders in the EU cost action on, it's called Open European Network for High Performance Computing on Complex Environments. And what we mean by complex environments is anything that deals with multiple levels of the memory and processor hierarchy. So anything from dual core, multi-core, multi-core systems, multi-core um, cluster systems, you know, all the way up to clouds, if you wish. Um, we have a website. It's not very uh, informative now, but we uh, by next year have written, hopefully, three or four white papers on this topic that I sort of give you a heads up for. And at Heteropar, it's a workshop at Europar, one of the at Premier conferences over in Europe. In August, we'll have uh, work, uh, papers in that um, workshop that comes out from this group. Um, so that's another place to look for interesting um, papers on this topic. Just sort of a fun, I wanted to see that this, it's now really mainstream to think about heterogeneous computing. Just in June uh, 9, you'll see I loaded this June 2nd article. Uh, sort of a snapshot of it from The Economist. So you know when The Economist is talking about heterogeneous computing, it really must be here, right? And uh, I think that Arm was driving home too, is that that's, uh, you know, you need to make money in this area, and economists, of course, uh, think about big uh, issues. I think I'm just about um, up, uh, wrapping up right now. So I want to say Tusen Tak, as we say in Norway, and uh, thank you.